Well, welcome everyone to our Genesis Bible study. And we're doing Genesis 25 and 26 today. But let's open with a word of prayer. God, we give you the Lighthouse Discord server. We give you everyone on it, Lord. We give you all the staff. We give you all the members. And we ask God for your hand of mercy and grace and peace and love to be upon everyone. Some have been impacted by COVID-19, Lord, and there's been a lot of stress. But Father, we know that you are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we know that Jesus accomplished everything for us on the cross. And so God, we give you praise and thanks and glory and honor that we can rely on you for answers, we can rely on you for comfort, for joy, and mostly, most of all, for salvation, God. We give you praise and glory for all that you've done for us and for all who you are. We ask that you would open our hearts and open our minds, open our ears to receive what you have for us today. Use your servant, Lord, and thank you for these books that we use. Thank you for your word. God, we give our entire study to you today. In the holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. So we're going to read Genesis 25 and 26, and Mitzi's going to read 26 for us. But 25 starts this way. Now, Abraham, and we have to just remember that Abraham's wife, Sarai, who later was named Sarah, passed away. So we're now at 25. Now Abraham took another wife whose name was Keturah. She bore to him Zimran and Jokshan and Medan and Midian and Ishbak and Shua. Jokshan became the father of Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Ashuram and Latushim and Lumim. The sons of Midian were Epha and Epher and Hanak and Abida and Alda. All these were the sons of Keturah. Lots of names in this. Now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, <clears throat> but to the sons of his concubines, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living and sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. These are all the years of Abraham's life that he lived, 175 years. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age with an old man and satisfied with life and he was gathered to his people. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah in the field of Ephron, the son of Zohar the Hittite, facing Mamre. The field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth, there Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. It came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived by Beer Lahai Roy. Now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael, Abraham's son, whom Hagar bore, sorry, whom Hagar the Egyptian, Sarah's maid, bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the son of Ishmael by their names in the order of their birth. Not sure I'm going to pronounce all of these correctly, but I will try. Nebaioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Ad Adbeel, and Mibsam, and Mishma, and Duma, and Massa, Hadad, and Tima, Jatur, Naphish, and Kadima. These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps, 12 princes according to their tribes. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. And he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt, as one goes toward Assyria. He settled in defiance of all his relatives. Now, these are the records of the generations of Isaac, Abraham's son. 
Abraham became the father of Isaac, and Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Paddan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren, and the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body, and one people shall be stronger than the other, and the older shall serve the younger. When her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over like a hairy garment, and they named him Esau. Afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob, and Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. When the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field, but Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. When Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from his field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. But Jacob said first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, <clears throat> I'm about to die. So of what use then is the birthright to me? And Jacob said, first swear to me. So he swore to him and sold his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil stew, and he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau de despised his birthright. That takes us to the end of 25. Mitzi? <clears throat> Now there was a famine in the land, besides the previous famine that had occurred in the days of Abraham. So Isaac went to Gerar, to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Stay in the land of which I shall tell you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For, you. for to you and to your descendants I will give all these lands, and I will establish the oath which I swore to your father Abraham. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and will give your descendants all these lands, and by your descendants all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Because Abraham obeyed me and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. So Isaac lived in Gerar. When the men of the place asked about his wife, he said, She is my sister, for he, for he was afraid to say, My wife, thinking the men of the place might kill me on account of Rebekah, for she is beautiful. It came about when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out through a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was caressing his wife, Rebekah. Then Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, certainly she is your wife. How then did you say she is my sister? And Isaac said to him, Because I said I might die on account of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech charged all the people, saying, He who touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Now Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundred a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man became rich and continued to grow richer until he became very wealthy. For he had possessions of flocks and herds and a great household, so that the Philistines envied him. Now all the wells which his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines stopped by stopped up by filling them with earth. Then Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are too powerful for us. And Isaac departed from there, and camped in the valley of Gerar, and settled there. Then Isaac dug again the wells of water which had been dug in the days of his father Abraham, for the Philistines had stopped them up after the death of Abraham, and he gave them the same names which his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley and found there a well of flowing water, the herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with the herdsmen of Isaac, saying, The water is ours. So he named the well Esek, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over it too, so he named it Sitna, he moved away from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he named it Rehoboth. For he said, At last the Lord has made room for us, and we will be fruitful in the land. 
Then he went down from there to Beersheba. The Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father Abraham. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for the sake of my servant Abraham. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. Then Abimelech came to him from Gerar with his advisor, Ahazah, and Frickel, the commander of his army. Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, since you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, Let there now be an oath between us, even between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you, and have done to you nothing but good, and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths, and then Isaac sent them away, and they departed from him in peace. Now it came about on the same day that Isaac's servants came in and told him about the well which they had dug, and said to him, We have found water. So he called it Sheba. Therefore the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. When Esau was forty years old, he married Judith, the daughter of Beeri, the Hittite, and Basmath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah. It seems weird to say, may God add the, his blessing to the reading of his word, but may he, but let's look forward to studying this. It's not always a nice story that we read in scripture, but <clears throat> as you were reading, Mitzi, it reminds me of what happened with Abraham and Sarah what Isaac did with Rebecca in telling someone important that their wives were their sister. Only in the case of Abraham and Sarah, it was sort of true because they were like half sister and half brother. Excuse me, just one moment, please. All right. So for anyone who does not already know, we are studying the Book of Genesis, The Smart Guide to the Bible series, written by Joyce L. Gibson, who is a curriculum writer at Wheaton College. So she tells us, God's covenant had been with Abraham for almost a century. He lived 37 years after Sarah died, and then it was time for him to die and for Isaac to carry on God's plan. And so from now on, the Bible shifts to Isaac and his heir who will receive the promised blessing. So Abraham's sons, Isaac and Ishmael, shared in the burial ceremonies for their father. And it is the last account we have that these two ever had contact with each other again. The scripture gives an account of Ishmael's descendants and finally his death. But the story returns to Isaac and the covenant blessings. And Isaac prayed for his son, and God gave him twin boys, Jacob and Esau. The twins, who grew up to have very different personalities and values, provide us with an important character building lesson or lessons. And I just want to make a note about um, the twins here for a moment. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is my, under, my personal understanding of the way it would work. When you have identical twins, typically, they're, well, I'm trying to recall the scientific name, but there's identical twins and then there's fraternal twins. And I believe that identical twins are kept in the same, like they're, they're very much the same. But typically with fraternal twins, you would have a boy and a girl, but sometimes you can have two girls or two boys but that's what makes them different, look different. Otherwise, identical twins typically look very identical. And in some families, you know, if I personally, I'm adopted, but I, I grew up, I, there were seven siblings or seven of us. Now I don't, I've met a, one of two of them, I guess but we all have some characteristics that make us look like we're brother and sister. But if you didn't know us, you might not know that. And I look very much like someone who's older than me in my biological family, but I never met them. I don't know anything really about them. 
but I did have that opportunity. But I just wanted to mention that, that it is possible to have twins that look very different from each other. So in a time of famine, Isaac follows his father's example in seeking relief by going to Egypt. But God stops him en route and Isaac stays in Gerar or Gerar where Abimelech is king. And like his father had done, Isaac claims that his wife is his sister. His deception is discovered and Isaac is asked to leave Gerar, though he is welcome to stay in the area. And God confirmed his covenant with Isaac and Isaac built an altar to the Lord. So Abraham had a long life. And in much of it, he enjoyed communication with God. But though the Bible does not record God speaking to him after he had tested Abraham with the sacrifice of Isaac, which we studied just recently, then Abraham's faith remains steady to the end of his life. So we've already read chapters 25 and 26. So the big picture of the first 11 verses of 25 is this. After Sarah's death, Abraham married Keturah and fathered six sons. Knowing he would soon die, he gave gifts to these sons and sent them away. But everything else he owned was left to Isaac. <clears throat> and when Abraham had lived 175 years, he died. Two of his sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him in the cave Abraham had purchased when Sarah died 37 years earlier. Now, even in his old age, Abraham fathered six sons by Keturah, his concubine. Keturah, as a secondary wife, had certain rights, but those Sarah, the primary wife, had, or but not the same, sorry, as Sarah, the primary wife, had. And this would have been the Jewish way. This would have been very much very different because in today's society, if you lose a spouse, and you choose to remarry, and that individual has all the same rights and freedoms as the original spouse. So it's very, very different in today's society. But now, <clears throat> none of these sons would be allowed to interfere with the covenant promises that were reserved for Isaac alone. And Abraham gave them gifts and sent them away as he had sent Ishmael away many years before. Ishmael's mother was one of Sarah's servants. So these sons moved to the country of the east in Genesis 25, 6, we're told, where they multiplied and grew to become tribes, thus fulfilling God's promise to Abraham that he would be a father of many nations. Now, Ray Ortland wrote this. The good memories of his first marriage gave Abraham the courage to do it again. Some people are content to remain widowed the rest of their lives, and that's okay. But Abraham was not one of those. And for all we know, this message to Keturah was a good one and blessed by God. The fact is, we don't really know because we're not told. And that's okay. There's some information that we are just simply not privy to. But <clears throat> when Abraham had lived 175 years, he died and he was gathered to his people. So this was the first indication in Genesis that there is life beyond the grave. Ishmael joined Isaac in burying their father in the cave he had purchased to bury Sarah. Now, one of my very favorite commentators passed away in 2019, Warren Wearsby. But he wrote this, the phrase gathered to his people does not mean buried with the family for Sarah's body was the only one in the family tomb. This is the first occurrence of this phrase in the Bible and it means to go to the realm of the dead, referring to the destiny of the spirit, not the body. James 2, 26. The Old Testament word for the realm of the dead is Sheol, and New Testament equivalent is Hades. It is the temporary home of the spirits of the dead awaiting the resurrection. And that comes out of Revelation 20, 11 to 15. 
So just one quick moment, please. So I want to explain, because this is not something that I have studied very deeply into, but when we die, we go to heaven. But here what they're saying is that the realm of the dead is Sheol. And the New Testament equivalent is Hades. So they're saying here that this is the temporary home of the spirits of the dead awaiting the resurrection. So it's like part of heaven. Part of hell. It's not it's not all together, I guess, like it is, but there's a lot of information there that I can't answer today on that and bodes a little more study and I probably will look into that further, but I just wanted to try to explain a little bit that it still does mean that there's heaven and hell for sure. Um, and some people interchange those words. So just thought I would mention that. So the big picture in Genesis 25 verses 12 to 18, here we read an account of Ishmael's family who settled in the south near the border of Egypt. And Ishmael lived 137 years and then died. And his descendants were continually hostile with other members of their family. I don't know if you know this, <clears throat> but the foundation of another Abrahamic religion. So there's Islam, there's Judaism and Christianity. All are considered Abrahamic religions. Sorry about that. So I just wanted to explain that those are three, the three Abrahamic religions, Islam, Christianity and Judaism. Ishmael is not the founder of Islam, but he played a key part in the foundation of that religion, or I should say Muhammad, the founder, is considered to be a descendant of Ishmael. And please understand, I'm not saying that there's any real correlation to Christianity because there isn't. But I do want to mention that the blessing of God and subsequently the future of Christianity surrounded Isaac, not Ishmael. And I think it bodes a mention on that so we understand. Okay, so <clears throat> both of these boys or men were loved by their father Abraham. But God's chosen line of blessing was to come through Isaac. And God had told Abraham to listen to Sarah's demand that Hagar and Ishmael be exiled from the camp in Genesis 21, 8 to 21. So a few chapters ago. But God had other promises for Ishmael. He had promised that he would increase his descendants so they would not be counted for multitude back in Genesis 16:10. Ishmael had 12 sons who became tribal rulers. And God also said that Ishmael would be a wild man. His hand shall be against every man and every man's hand against him. And he would dwell in the presence of all his brethren in Genesis 16, 12. So in this passage, we see God's predictions being fulfilled. Ishmael's descendants became tribes who settled in the Arabian Peninsula. And they did indeed live in the presence of all his brethren. Harry M. Morris wrote this. Ishmael at that time was 90 years old. His own 12 sons were grown and they had become prolific and powerful enough to have settled towns and strongholds of their own and to be called princes, as God had promised. But again, the theme of waiting comes to Isaac's life. When he married Rebecca, he longed to have a son to whom he could pass on the blessing that had come to him through Abraham. And he waited 20 years 
for God to provide that son. Not near as long as Abraham and Sarah, but still 20 years is a good while to wait in a marriage to have a child. Now the big picture <clears throat> of Genesis 25, 19 to 26 is this. Isaac was 40 when he married Rebekah, his cousin from Nahor's family in Padan Haram. When Rebekah was barren, Isaac prayed for her. God answered his prayers and she became pregnant with twins. Rebekah turned to God in prayer when there was conflict in her womb and God revealed to her the future of the twin sons that would be born. Two nations were in her womb, two peoples who would not live in harmony, one younger being stronger than the other and the older son serving the younger. At their birth, the first son who was red and hairy was called Esau. The second son who was born grasping his twin's heel was named Jacob. Now, Isaac was a wealthy man. He had inherited everything that Abraham had owned. And he was also under the covenant that God had made with Abraham. However, the promises God had made required Isaac to have a son. How else would God make a great nation of Abraham's descendants, giving the land to his seed and blessing of all the families of the earth? So Isaac had married Rebekah when he was 40 years old. Now he was approaching 60, and he still had no son. Rebekah was barren. But Isaac prayed, and God answered, and Rebekah became pregnant. God, who knows every detail of our lives, knows the heart cry of a couple who long for a child. Now, I know what it's like to long for a child. Because I wanted to have children. But God had other plans, and I did not. But in those days, in fact, even in New Testament days, it was almost considered essential to Jewish people to have children. Because if you didn't have children, who would look after you when you got older? There weren't care homes, there weren't care aids and things like there are today. This was very, very important to a Jewish family to have offspring. And very often, if you did not have offspring, then the wives, first of all, would feel dreadful. They would feel as though they had done something wrong. And Jewish people typically would have felt as though they were missing something or that God was punishing them for something. Like this was serious business to them. This wasn't just, you know, I'm going to tell you, <clears throat> not being able to have children was one of the hardest things that I've ever had to go through. I wanted children so much. In fact, that's what I believed God wanted from me. But it wasn't to be. I understand that pain. There's a lot of people out there who can have children almost at the drop of a hat. But then there's others who can't. And I can just hear Rebecca's cry, wanting to be able to give Isaac those children and not being able to do so. It was painful. And I just want to mention that. But God knew. He was already working. And Elizabeth Elliot wrote, Waiting on God is an act of faith, the greatest thing ever required of us humans. Not faith in the outcome we are dictating to God, but faith in his character, faith in himself. It is resting in the perfect confidence that he will guide in the right way at the right time. He will supply our need. He will fulfill his word. He will give us the very best if we trust him. So note, God may not always give us what we want. But if we pray and ask for God's will to be done in our lives, he will definitely give us what is best for us.
no matter what. So why was there a struggle? <clears throat> Rebecca conceived twins. And her heart must have rejoiced at this. But when she felt the babies moving in her womb, she sensed that something unusual and maybe even disturbing was happening. Because instead of the normal movement, the babies were actually struggling with each other, even in the womb. And wondering what the significance of this was, Rebecca went to the Lord and his answer showed that he had or has intimate knowledge of the unborn. Please read Psalm 139 verses 1 through 18. That will help you understand how much God sees of us before we're even born. And God told her that the founders of two nations were within her womb. And the struggle she felt would endure in the two nations throughout history. <clears throat> and further, though custom would dictate that the firstborn would be the favored one, this would not be true of her twin sons. The firstborn would serve the secondborn. Now, Dr. Larry Richards happens to be the editor of all of this series of books we study. And he wrote this, the older will serve the younger. Romans 9 emphasizes the importance of God's statement to Rebecca before her twin sons were born. God's choice of Jacob the younger to inherit his covenant promise was made before the boys were born. This showed that the choice did not depend on what either did. God is free to choose as he wills. The fact that Esau proved to be uninterested in spiritual things shows how wise God's choices are. All right. So God does have intimate knowledge of the unborn. And God had told Rebecca, like I said, that the founders of the two nations were within her womb. And so that struggle that she felt would endure throughout history. So what happens next? The twins are born. The first came out red and he was like a hairy garment all over. And his parents named him Esau, which actually means hairy, H-A-I-R-Y. The second twin was actually born grasping Esau's heel, and his parents named him Jacob, which meant one who grasps the heel. In brackets, figuratively, he deceives, or a supplanter. Interesting. I like the name Jacob. That's not an unusual name. But to be called, he deceives, <laughs> you know? But that's how it was. And Esau, Harry, H-A-I-R-Y. That's the meaning. It's just odd. But anyway, so the twins who had appeared so unlike at birth grew up to be very different from each other. Esau became an outdoorsman. He was skilled at hunting. But Jacob was a quiet person, content to stay by the tents, probably tending his father's flocks and herds. And the Hebrew word for quiet, which is tam, T-A-M, means perfect or possibly mature. Isaac favored Esau because Esau brought home the wild game that he enjoyed eating. Rebecca favored Jacob. And the Bible account shows the pain that follows when a parent shows favoritism. So Cynthia Ulrich Tobias wrote this. <clears throat> If you are a parent with more than one child, you've already discovered that even children growing up in very similar circumstances and environments can have dramatically dissimilar approaches to life. You begin to realize that people are fundamentally different. The individual bents that cause each person to be unique often bring an overwhelming challenge to parents. It is not enough to simply decide how children should be reared and then apply the same techniques to each child. Parents need to get to know their children and no two will be the same. Jean Getz wrote this, 
Esau's whole body was like a hairy garment. Even today, children are sometimes born with an excessive amount of hair on their bodies, a condition known as hypertrichosis. So now we're into verses 29 to 34. And the big picture tells us that one day when Jacob was cooking red stew, Esau came from the open fields feeling famished. He implored Jacob to give him a serving of the stew. And Jacob offered the food on the condition that Esau first sell him his birthright. Esau complied, ate the food, and left. In that transaction, he showed that he despised the birthright. Now, I find that word despise to be different. Because to me, it's like he just plain and simple did not care. When I use the word despise, I use it as hating. But I didn't get the feeling necessarily he hated it, but maybe he did. He just didn't care, at least in my mind. And so Joyce tells us in his role as a stay-at-home son, Jacob was cooking a thick soup of lentils when Esau came in from the fields. Lentils were probably grown as a crop and they turn a rich chocolate red color when they're boiled. Probably like uh, chili beans. And the colorful food cooking in the pot and its tempting aroma reminded Esau that he was very hungry. In fact, he felt so famished that he could not bear to wait to eat until he had prepared something for himself. And he begged Jacob to give him some of it right away. So Jacob seizes the opportunity to make a proposal. Yes, he would be giving a serving of lentils to Esau, but Esau must give his birthright in exchange for the meal. The fact that Esau agreed to the proposal so quickly indicates how little he prized the birthright. Jacob, on the other hand, must have been amazed that Esau placed so little value in it. So like I said, not necessarily hating it, but certainly did not prize the birthright. And Esau reasoned that if he were to die of hunger, the birthright would be of no use to him, so he agreed to the proposal. Jacob wisely insisted that Esau swear formally to the sale of the birthright. And the business deal was consummated. Esau ate the lentils, and Jacob got the birthright. In making this deal, both men lost out. Esau betrayed himself as a profane person. Please understand the word profane as meaning unholy or not set apart for God, who did not care about spiritual values. Jacob, on the other hand, made a deal for something that God had promised he would have anyway. So what is a birthright actually worth? Well, in patriarchal times, a custom was for the firstborn son to inherit a double portion of the estate. So on this occasion, this valuable inheritance was traded for something of lesser value that could be obtained for immediate use. In Isaac's case, however, he would be passing to the son, receiving the birthright, the covenant promise that God had first made to Abraham. And this part of the birthright was worth far more than the material aspects of the inheritance. Esau lived for the here and now and had no regard for the spiritual part of the birthright. Isaac clearly favored Esau while Rebekah favored Jacob. Isaac had known from before the birth of his son that Jacob had been chosen by God to receive the special covenant blessings that had first been given to Abraham. Now Henry M. Morris wrote this, the eldest son customarily received a double portion in the division of the inheritance according to Deuteronomy 21.17 and the right to lead the household in Genesis 27, 29. The eldest son, of course, also had sober responsibilities. If he was to rule over the household, when he had to provide for the household, both materially and spiritually. In fact, in this particular family, the spiritual responsibilities were paramount. In Genesis 18, 19, because in particular, there was the responsibility of building and officiating at the altar. And there's a few scriptures in Genesis 22, 9, Genesis 22, 25, 
and Genesis 35, 1, as well as the transmission of God's word and his promises. So Joyce tells us Jacob did not have to bargain to get the birthright because God had already promised that it would be his. How often, and, and this is a question for all of us to consider here, how often do we manipulate others to get what we want instead of committing our desire to the Lord and letting him work things out in his time and in his way? Think about that. You want something so bad. Could be anything. Anything at all. And it's seemingly impossible. Do you ask the Lord to let him work things out in his way and in his time? Or do you set the wheels in motion to bring that about? And what's the end result? Not judging, just asking the question. But just to keep that in our minds. So now we're on Genesis 26. It's not hard to trust God when all is going well in life, but when trouble comes, we're tempted to rely on our own resources. And I'm just going to say for me, in the way that I am, the kind of person I am, I'm the opposite. <laughs> when things are going good, I tempt. I tend to rely on my own resources. When things get rough is when I tend to lean on Jesus. But everybody's different. We all go about doing things different. And here, Isaac followed his father's faulty example, and he decided to go to Egypt to find food. So Genesis 26, and I'll try and get through this reasonably quickly. The big picture. When a famine came to Canaan, Isaac decided to relocate. He moves his family, servants, flocks, and herds to Gerar, where Abimelech, king of the Philistines, lived. There the Lord appeared to Isaac and told him not to proceed further to Egypt as planned, but to stay where he was. God would be with him and bless him. Then God confirmed that the promises he had made to Abraham were continued to Isaac. When the men of Gerar made inquiries about Rebekah, Isaac said, she was a sister. Abimelech confronted Isaac with his deception and issued a death warrant for anyone who had molested Isaac or Rebekah. Isaac settled in, planted crops, and reaped a hundredfold. Philistine neighbors became so envious that they stopped up the wells Abraham had dug. And at Abimelech's request, Isaac moved to the valley of Gerar, where he reopened wells Abraham had dug. Quarrels broke out with Philistine herdsmen over the wells, and Isaac refused to fight, but moved away and dug another well. Finally, Abimelech came to Isaac to make a treaty. You see, famine came to Canaan, and there was a shortage of food and water for Isaac's family and for his extensive flocks and herds. So Isaac decided it was necessary to relocate to a more favorable area. And the Lord here confirmed his covenant with Isaac. Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your descendants I give all these lands. And I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Genesis 26, 2 to 5, that was the New King James Version. Warren Wearsby, commentator, wrote, We can never successfully run away from trials because God sees to it that his children learn the lessons of faith regardless of where they go. We can never grow in faith by running. From difficulty. And that is so true, friend. If you're having struggles, you need to let us know on the server. Because then we can pray for you. We may not always have an answer, but we can most certainly lift 
your needs in prayer. But Isaac's conduct in Gerar was a sad replay of his father's deception. On two different occasions, in Genesis 12, 10 to 20, and Genesis 21 to 13. When the men of Gerar asked Isaac about Rebekah, he answered that she was his sister. And he did this because he was afraid that if they knew that she was his wife, they would kill him in order to be free to take her. And that's exactly how Abraham had responded earlier in those two accounts. But one day Abimelech saw Isaac caressing Rebekah and figured out that she was his wife. So he's alarmed. So he asked, and the pagan king then gave orders to all in Gerar, he who touches, this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. What if Isaac's marriage to Rebekah had been violated? What would have happened to the promises to Abraham? God intervened and used a pagan king to protect his covenant. Isaac faltered in his faith, but God was faithful. The reason I'm emphasizing this, friends, is because of the fact that God will use whatever he chooses to use for his purposes. And in this situation, as we know, when we look at COVID-19 and all that's around and all the conspiracy theories and all the stress and all the worry and all of this, all our government authorities are not all Christians. Not every decision that's made is based on faith, but it's on the knowledge based on what people know god uses that for his glory in spite of the sadness the depression and the horror of what's going on around us because yes people are losing their lives thousands of people to us it's numbers unless we know someone close but each and every person who has passed is a real person. Family with emotions, with livelihoods, maybe with children and friends and careers and all of that. So I just want to help put that into perspective. God will use whatever or whomever he chooses. Not our choice, his choice. So some Bible experts, thinking of Isaac's conduct compared to Abraham, some Bible experts have surmised that the writer was confused. But while there are similarities, there are also differences in the three accounts. Since there is a 90-year gap between the account of Abraham in chapter 20 and the account of Isaac in chapter 26, it is quite unlikely that Abimelech is the same man. Abimelech was a title similar to president or king, just like the title of pharaoh, and because there were a few pharaohs. So what did Abraham and Isaac do during the famine? So there was a famine in Canaan in Genesis 12, 10, and Isaac in Genesis 26, 1. They planned to go to Egypt, Abraham the first time in Genesis 12, 10, and then it's implied by Isaac in Genesis 26, 2. Then God confirms his covenant to Isaac in Genesis 26, 3 to 6. Abraham, the second time, the second time he goes through a famine in Genesis 20 and 1, stays in Gerar. Isaac stays in Gerar in Genesis 26, 6. Abraham, the first time, is motivated by fear for his life in Genesis 12. Abraham in Genesis 20, again. And then in Genesis 26, we hear about Isaac. And then Abraham calls his wife is sister in Genesis 12, Genesis 20, 
and Isaac does in Genesis 26. And then we hear about their wives' beauty in Genesis 12 for Abraham and Genesis 24 for Isaac. Then we hear about Abimelech's alarm at possible adultery for Abraham in Genesis 20 and Isaac in Genesis 26. All three times they receive a rebuke. So Abraham in Genesis 12 and Genesis 20, Isaac in Genesis 26. Through all three times they're asked to leave. Genesis 12 and Genesis 20 for Abraham and Genesis 26 for Isaac. So do you understand when, when I'm reading this table here, there's a lot of similarities. But then the treaty was requested by Abimelech. First in Genesis 21 with Abraham and second with Isaac in Genesis 26. So Isaac stays in the land, plants the crops, and even in a time of famine, he was blessed with bumper crops that yielded a hundredfold. I can totally relate to that because I was raised on a vineyard. When we moved there, the first yield of grapes that we had was a hundred ton, or sorry, was one ton of grapes. That's not a lot of grapes because grapes are actually very heavy. Um, Dad got the vineyard at a great price because there had been a really bad winter the year before. Ten years later, when I was 16, my father yielded over a hundred ton of grapes. Through a lot of hard work and effort, my parents, in 10 years, turned that vineyard around. See how God can bless? And my parents weren't Christians, by the way, but God can turn our circumstances around. And that's what he did with Abraham. And one way that they could sabotage his prosperity was to dry up his water supply. And that's a big deal when it comes to agriculture. And so what did they do? I'm reminded of the game Minecraft that Mitzi and I have been playing so much because they were filling the wells with earth. And these were wells that Abraham's servants had actually dug many years before. So Abimelech then decides that it's in the best interest for Isaac to move away. So Isaac then settles in Gerar where Abraham had dug wells, but Isaac restored them and assigned them the same names that Abraham had given them. And no matter how the Philistines opposed Isaac, God worked out his plan to give Abraham's descendants the land. But before long, the herdsmen of Gerar fought with Isaac's men, claiming that the water was theirs. So Isaac named the well Esek, E-S-E-K, which means dispute. So soon after, he had fresh water from a second well, and another quarrel erupts. And this well he named Sitna, which means opposition. Isaac refused to fight for what was rightfully his. But eventually, the Philistines left him alone. And the third well was called Rehoboth which means room. So after a time, Isaac moves to Beersheba. There God appeared to him and confirmed again the covenant he had given to Abraham. Abraham had built altars at Beersheba. Now Isaac built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord. Derek Kidner tells us the altars built by the patriarchs were a response rather than an initiative. For the most part, they gratefully record God's coming and speaking to his servants. Genesis 12, 7, Genesis 13, 17 to 18, and Genesis 35, 7 all speak to that. So Abimelech arrives with his personal advisor, the commander of his forces. Isaac asks why he'd come since Abimelech had been hostile and had sent him away from Gerar. And the delegation replied that it was obvious that God was with Isaac so they felt the need of a sworn treaty that Isaac would not do them harm. So what does Isaac do? But he prepares a feast. The parties then the next morning swear an oath and they renew the treaty that Abraham had made with Abimelech almost a century before. Isaac was a peacemaker and eventually was able to live at peace with his neighbors. We can learn much from Isaac's dealing with Abimelech. 
He approached the potential controversy with candor as he questioned the sincerity of his guest. He showed restraint in not even replying to the statement that the Philistines had always treated him well. Then he dignified the treaty by preparing a meal, a feast for his guests. And so when Esau was 40 years old, he brought grief to Isaac and Rebekah by marrying two Hittite women, Judith and Basemeth. These women were from an ungodly background and would have no understanding of God's covenant with Abraham and Isaac or of the special privileges available to them to know the true and living God. Hittites were a group of migrants in Canaan originally from an empire that included Syria. And Donald Joy wrote this, Esau's vulnerability was that he wanted it all. Now, maybe that's the real definition of worldly minded, to regard this present world as all there is and to take a tragically terminal view of reality. If we are willing to settle for a tangible, transient, sensuous experience as the ultimate reality, we will likely get it one way or another. Let's pray. God, we ask that you would help us to be patient and understanding and to seek what you would have for us instead of settling for a tangible, transient, sensuous experience as our ultimate reality. Help us, God to understand who you are for what you did for us, God, and for your desire in our lives. Help us, Lord God, to focus on you and put you first in every area of our lives. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the thanksgiving. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen.